My name is Mukweti Masisi. I am president of the Republic of Botswana. This documentary focuses on the role communities can play in the conservation of our wildlife species and environment. Please take time and watch it. Botswana is one of Africa's premier tourist destinations and the Okavango Delta is undoubtedly the jewel of the Kalahari. This UNESCO World Heritage Site is one of the world's largest inland deltas and ranges in size from 15,000 square kilometers during drier periods to over 22,000 square kilometers in wetter times. Thousands of remote islands, encircled by endless palm and papyrus-fringed waterways, teem with prolific wildlife and countless bird species. A picture-perfect destination for photo tourism. But the tourism industry is cutthroat, with countless global destinations offering a wide selection of choices. In order to compete in this sector, intensive marketing is essential and the development of a strong brand key. Selling the Wild Africa product requires that the brand appeals to the sensitivities of the Western clientele's worldview. In that Lion King universe, the endless, untamed wilderness is devoid of the human touch. Although the Okavango Delta is a unique drawcard for Botswana, a competitive edge is vital when competing in the crowded tourism space. In the quest to trump rival regional destinations, Botswana's photo tourism sector found just the ticket. With a little help from friends in high places, safari hunting was banned on all but private land in January 2014. The all new and improved brand Botswana could now be promoted as a blood-free destination, a safe haven into which persecuted elephants could escape from safari hunting in the neighboring countries of Zimbabwe and Namibia. Whilst this decision may have favored brand Botswana, there was little widespread inclusive consultation and scant regard was given to the implications for both people and wildlife. My name is Jack Frank Ramsden. I'm a fourth generation livestock farmer and a conservationist at heart. Our family has always had ties to both livestock and conservation. My grandfather being one of the committee members, in fact, he was the chairman of the committee that helped establish the Muremi Game Reserve on behalf of the Batawana tribe in the early 60s. We've been involved with livestock farming in the Hanafelt since the mid 70s. We've had problems with predators here and there. You would get a lion every once, three, four years in between, a few leopard here and there. But in the last decade to 15 years, we have realized an increased problem with lion. And I would say in the last five years, We've had now a major problem with elephant. First it was one or two bulls passing through, then it was four. Now it's escalating to even breeding herds with 10 cows, a few, few calves, causing problems with our fences, uh, destroying our irrigation systems. After experiencing the problems that we were having in the Hannafeld, I decided to take a cross-country trip to see if other people were going through the same problems or not. I was invited to a meeting with community elders from areas like Shakawe, Gudikwa, Pandamatenga, Kasani, Mababe, Sankoyo. The main purpose of this meeting was to discuss the issue of human wildlife conflict and how these communities were coping. The meeting was a lively, passionate affair. The elders really expressing their points of view and it was a big eye-opener for me. It drove me to want to find out more. Where I come from, we have almost six forest reserves in Chobe. Those forest reserves are no longer forest reserves because the elephants are eating the trees and they are, they are turning that land into 
into a desert. They think conservation is increasing the numbers, increase and increase and increase. Put pressure, put pressure, put pressure. They don't even take on consideration of the grass. We are conserving the elephant while the elephant is busy destroying us and our vegetation. You will agree with me when you just say Kasaini and Ogavango and Gamilet are the poorest among the, the poorest sectors or areas in Botswana. These are the areas where communities are ill-informed. These are where communities are not even consulted. We still remain spectators in the process of conservation. And we still remain into the receiving ends of assimilative, complicated policies that do not even communicate to our own interests. And if I may ask, these recommendations that come from this conservation fraternity, where do they meet with the traditional knowledge? Do we have tools or research information available on how traditional conservation, uh, traditional conservation who have impacted to the habitat, to our natural habitat? And how does the two for, uh, platforms inform one another? We are the butter in this bread. Because we are taken everywhere. We, there. we know we need to be neutral because in our communities we know there are those that are subscribed to those and there are those that subscribe to the, the other ones. And what about the elephants? What about the conflicts? Do we have budget and plan to, 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 to come to, to, to combat issues that are going to emerge soon regarding elephants? The modern conservationists are not even concerned. They don't care in our, with our welfare. We have ideas on how we can better conserve this biodiversity, benefit from it. And this, is, this has been dormant for so long. And we, we are waiting to hear what the government would say on how do we access and benefit and justify it from the natural resources to convince this community the benefits of conservation. It's a high time that you meet and strike a balance. Because if you say it's me on photography and the other one says it's me on game ranging, the other one is saying it's me on, on hunting, I'm telling you, we are not going to make it. And let's emphasize more on consultation that well, the consultation system the China that is using is not adequate. At the end of the day, who suffers? We are the ones who are complaining about human wildlife conflict. We are the ones who are complaining, complaining about an undignified treatment. We are the ones who are complaining about marginalization and poverty. I left that meeting with a new perspective. I wanted to find out more. The next step for me was to get an overview of what was really going on. Over the past 35 years, Botswana's rural population has declined considerably, due mostly to the economic lure of urban life. However, around 50% of the country's total still live in the rural areas, and arable farming is the major source of income. 80% of Botswana's 582,000 square kilometer land area is covered by the Kalahari Desert but only 5% is suitable for arable agriculture and less than 1% is under cultivation. Agriculture comprises a mere 2.4% of GDP, but it is vital to the livelihoods of the country's rural populace. The livestock industry has been supported for many years by subsidies from the European Union in order to access that market. But certain conditions, including disease control, have to be met. Foot and mouth disease is highly contagious and easily spread. Cape buffalo are considered a reservoir species for the disease and fencing is the only way to separate buffalo from livestock. Two zones have been defined, the red zone for livestock ranching where buffalo occur and the green zone on the other side of the fence. Red zone livestock which have not been vaccinated and quarantined along with livestock products cannot be transported into the green zone. All of northern Botswana falls within the red zone because of the prolific wildlife, and so farmers within that area are restricted in their ability to access the more lucrative beef markets. The Heinefeld farms are situated within the red zone between the central Kalahari game reserve and the Okavango Delta. The area was originally zoned for commercial cattle development, but today the southernmost tier of Heinefeld farms operate as game ranches. In the north, cattle ranching is still the principal activity. 
when I was growing up in this part of the country, there was never any elephant. But starting about 10 to 15 years ago, you started getting the odd ball here and there that would come across to these sides. And back then it was novelty. People liked seeing an elephant every once in a while. But it has grown from the single ball to breeding herds, bachelor bulls. It's, it's, uh, it's becoming a real, or it has actually become a real, real problem. And, it's affecting people's uh, livelihoods. My father started farming in 1971. I came into farming in 2003. I buy a bit of cattle with the government money. Today I'm still servicing the loan, but the elephants are destroying the fences, the tanks, and the, the borehole also. No, the elephants are destroyed, destroyed the borehole here. They just pulled the pipes out from the borehole. The pump was damaged already. He was just explaining to me that this tank, like that one standing over there, the elephant came and grabbed the top part of it, where the lid is, and just ripped it apart so that it would get to the water. So, as you can see here, the challenges that these men are facing here, or we are facing here as farmers in the Hanna farm. You've got one tank being completely destroyed, which in itself, to get that tank, to bring it here and come and set it up, that's money in itself. He's got a second tank that he's put up, and within a very short period of time, you've got an elephant coming and putting its tusk through it to get to water. So, you know, in terms of financial challenges in this place, you can really appreciate the challenges that these guys are going through here. There's very little doubt that the paradigm that has been really imposed on the red zone uh, rural people has failed to service their needs. And, um, and it's very clear that in, in after all these years that these people, these rural communities that live just outside these spectacular wildlife areas are more impoverished than they were just 10 years ago. Driving along the Hannafeld boundary, we came across this carcass that obviously this elephant was shot and not on anybody's farm in particular. What probably happened here is that somebody came across this elephant walking by the side of the boundary and shot it just randomly. This shows growing resentment towards these animals because people are not finding value in them anymore. They, they see them as, as pests, as a, as a nuisance, as animals that cost them money and production of, the, of their livestock. Across the veterinary fence from the Heinefeld farms in the green zone lies a number of cattle ranches which were previously managed by the Botswana government. In the 70s, it was uh, all cattle ranches for government. They've managed that basically for a 15, 20 year period here. And eventually they gave up because point number one, it was very high elephant and leopard population in this area. Um, they've lo just lost so many cattle in this area. And also then it was the other thing of the water. And, and then when the water dried up, in 81 in this area, they basically abandoned these farms. Majority of the farms actually went in as game farms in those areas. I think there was two or three people that opted to go multi, uh, which is then game and cattle. And I think there was one that stayed as a cattle farm. And around about 2005, there was so much conflict with the elephants in this area. And there was also a lot of buffalo in the area. And they had to stop the buffalo coming in to all the community areas in this area. And that's when they, in conjunction with the EU, then got funds together to erect this game fence that's here. And this was a highly electrified, game-proof fence that I've put up here. Not just for animals, but to stop all predators and all that in this area. It really was a very successful fence at that time. It wasn't long after wildlife took over the fence to maintain it. Batteries got stolen and solar panels got started. And the elephants really learned how to adapt to that electricity. And the moment they started to break through, uh, then there was no control anymore. This then became a migration route through these farms here. Yeah. And they then just came in now from the, from the western side. And they're coming in from the northern side and they're coming in from the southern side. This is the old Francis down the road, the Mama Sadingana. But here you can see, now we, that's a red zone on that side. Now the cattle from that side walk across, try to get into our place. So now we're in a major conflict of, of zones. That is foot and mouth inoculated area. This is not foot and mouth free area. So it becomes a serious problem now. Yeah. And, and in a couple of years time, we will lose our quality of our zone and we become inoculated area. 
So then we can't export any live game from here or any meat out of this area. And this is the fear that we've got. This elephant is not even an hour late here, climbed over the fence yet. We can't keep these fences because it's hourly. We've got elephant in and out of this area. People want to ask us, what does it cost in money? It is the losses of your game on the farm where the real money come in. The government has always maintained the moment game has left your property, it then becomes the property of government. While the game is in your farm, then it's the property of the landowner, which is the opposite from beef and domestic animals. Then we, we have got the problem of uh, elephants. You know, they're destroying the tanks almost on a daily basis. We had about eight or nine lions which were killing uh, cattle. Sometimes we make fire during the night at, at, at the crawl, big fire, so that way we can just to scare them off. Yeah. Yeah. And is it working? Yeah, sometimes, but you know, when they're very hungry, they, they even go into the crawl. Into the crawl? Yeah. And kill the cattle and the Yeah. Crawl. And how often is that? They come here on a daily basis. Sometimes they spend almost about a, a week into the farm. You can hear them roaring at night and in, even in the afternoon. Mike, I see these trenches here. These are the trenches you've dug to protect the dam. Yeah. But there's tracks back there that show that the elephants still come in. Every single day they're coming in drinking water, every single day. At night? At night, yes. Yeah. Having visited all of these farms and seeing the uphill battles that some of these farmers have to go through in terms of losing cattle to lion and having to dig trenches around their reservoirs to stop the elephants from breaking them. I'm amazed really by the resolve that these, some of these people have to actually keep this up, to lose a hundred animals. You're looking at six, six to seven hundred thousand bulas worth of, of losses in a year. If, if this extent of conflict was on my farm, I do have conflict but not to this extent, I would lose my livelihood if I was to incur this many losses. That's a real challenge. I'm amazed actually that they're still out here. After visiting the Makalamabedi commercial cattle ranches, I decided to go and pay a visit to the mixed subsistence farmers along the Boteti River to see how they were coping. <laughs> There's no need to plow because the elephant used to come here and, and eat all my grains. So my aim was to sell my field, to go and stay in town. The life is going to be difficult because me, I'm a, I'm a farmer. I'm afraid to stay here. Each and every night they come. It was on Sunday at 3 o'clock, three of them, they passed through the village there. We cannot go around and look at our cattle here. We are afraid to go in the bush. Our animals are wild like wild animals because of the elephant. Sometimes they kill the animals. It's this wildlife office, I don't know why it's the government or why, we don't know. Because they are the other one who's responsible for these animals. They say it is our animals, we should live with them. And I don't my animals because I cannot benefit from them. We have told them that the, if they can make a plenty out of it, they can take them back where they came from. Then they say we should live with them. Sometimes we ask ourselves, why did God make such animals like this? I was asking myself that question. We are troubled. We are in trouble here in Mawan. And we don't have guns. We don't have food. A drought, no food, no money. Yeah. So we don't know what can we do. At 7 o'clock, I'm staying at home. I, didn't, I don't want to go there. I cannot say, no, let me go there. I want to check my grandmother there, or I want to visit somebody. At 7 o'clock, when the sun goes set, I'm just home. We are in refugee camp here. These are free seeds that government issues. Um, but she didn't plow this year because there's no point. She was going to plow this, invest energy and time and labor, and she wasn't going to get a harvest out of it. DWN Puyas, the Department of Wildlife and National Parks, came and shot an elephant on her field last year. She was telling me that she still hasn't received compensation for the crop that she lost last year to these animals. This area where we are now, she had planted sorghum. She was expecting, according to her, about 30 bags of sorghum. She only managed to get 15. Behind us, where we just came from now, she had planted an acre of beans, and she was expecting about 15, between 15 and 20 bags of beans from that, and she got absolutely nothing out of that. 
she doesn't know how she's gonna feed her family this year because she hasn't plowed at all this year for fear of elephants. As you can see, how I feel nothing to do because of the elephants. They're moving up and round everywhere. We can't do anything. We can't stay with the elephants. We are suffering. See my fields. Nothing to eat. What he's basically saying is that the elephant population in this area has completely exploded since 2013. This whole riverfront where people used to grow vegetables, you know, where people had their gardens here. And now when you look at it, we are standing right next to one that has been abandoned. The owner lives up there and she has completely given up, but she used to sustain herself using this vegetable garden. Another issue that concerned to him is the issue of self-sufficiency in terms of food production and the culture of self-sufficiency and self-reliance where people along this whole riverfront throughout the year used to plow and produce their own food. You know, they had sorghum, they had maize, butternut, milk and meat from their cattle throughout the year. Self-sustaining communities that are it's basically now that whole culture is collapsing because of the conflict that they have with elephant in this area. Thank you, sir. Terrible. I'm glad we met you. After spending time with the farmers in the Makalamabedi and Samidupi area along the Buteti, it was now time to move northwest up to the Okavango Delta Panhandle and beyond. Crossing the Okavango River on the ferry from Mohembo over to the Saronga side to meet with more with communities and see what's going on there and just get a, a feeling of how they are coping with the current situation with elephant. The human population of the 13 villages in the eastern section of the Okavango Panhandle is approximately 16,000 and the elephant population around 11,000. Under customary Botswana law, every tribesperson is entitled to sufficient land to meet the needs for housing and arable farming, as well as access for livestock to communal grazing lands and water. Living next to the Okavango Delta protected area and sharing these natural resources with the wildlife can be tough for the people of the district. Conservation areas are not just ecological areas. They are critically uh, linked to people around them, to political influences, etc. And as such, in science, they are described as socio-ecological systems. We cannot consider a, pr a protected area in isolation to the surrounding areas. If we do, in the long term, that protected area will fail. In the Okavango Delta, we have almost 13 of the community-based organizations. These are the organizations which, uh, when they started in the early 1990s, the main land use for the concession areas they had was mostly photo tourism and safari hunting. So safari hunting continued in the Okavango until it was suspended in 2014. Before then, more than 75% of the income which communities generated came from safari hunting. We are here in the village of Udikwa, moving around, asking people with the situation of the human wildlife conflict and how it's affecting them and how they're managing to survive out here. He was born and bred here and growing up here. They've had challenges of predation on livestock, loss of crops, and indeed loss of life, of human life. Back in the day, the wildlife was fearful of people. Elephants were afraid of people's fires at night. Lions would not, according to him, would not come um, near people or near people's homesteads. But today that seems to have changed. Um, elephants are getting closer and closer to people. They are losing that natural fear of human beings. Same story um, goes for the lions as well.
So what Mr. Rapula is just telling me is that before, when they could plow crops on fields like these that are no longer productive, people could feed their children throughout the year. He has got nine children. Every day he has to make a plan of feeding these children. He has to make a plan of clothing these children and just basically doing his best to give them a dignified life, which at the moment is not that easy because he earns 500 pula every once in a while from Ipelekeng. I asked him a question. Because there were still elephants, how were the plowing fields surviving then and why can't they survive now? His answer is that when they were hunting in the form of a control measure, there were not that many elephants in this area because they knew that they were getting shot. And on top of that, there were watering holes that are now dry back in there that kept a lot of the elephant out there instead of them now coming to drink at the river, which is not too far from here, right next to the villages. So Mr. Rapula was just telling me that as we found him this morning at eight o'clock at home, he basically now has got no plans unemployed, can't harvest anything from his field. All he does now is just spend the whole day at home with his kids with no livelihood, basically. And he was just giving me a short history of how he would get over 30 bags of millet in this field alone, beans, groundnuts, watermelons, pumpkins. And he used to sell the surplus at, at some times at 400 pula per bag and he would keep stuff to feed himself and his family. And now we found him at eight o'clock this morning. He was still sitting at his house. He's got really, there's no plan. He just doesn't have a plan. And there's no industry in this place. After 2014, when safari hunting was suspended, we started having all these animals moving into human settlements. They are now all over. Elephants are responsible for crop damage. The reports indicate that a large number of people have been killed by elephants, simply because elephants have moved into human settlements. This is Dungu Cattle Post, just the outskirts of Soronga village. It's eight kilometers on the way to Shakawe. People living here, they are no longer staying here due to destruction caused by elephants. They have abandoned their places. They have abandoned their fields. There's fresh tracks from last night and there's fresh elephant dung out there. Just goes to show you the close proximity that these people have had to live with, with elephants. Herbivores, whether it be elephants or any other type of herbivore, when they undergo predation, they very quickly perceive a danger to those areas and a risk in those areas. And so they start to avoid those areas. It is known as the landscape of fear. Elephants perceive very quickly a hunting landscape of fear so that they will stop coming into these community areas once we implement a strong hunting regime. This is Mr. Jackson, and um, I'm told that he's been having some problems with lions predating on his cattle, and he just wanted to share his story with us today. He managed to accumulate his livestock with the earnings that he got from when he used to be a hunter. The last couple of years, the lions are becoming more bold, the hyenas are becoming more bold, where they are literally hunting the livestock inside the village. I also asked him how many cattle he had. He had at one point 160 head of cattle. He's down to 20 or 25 cattle. So yesterday he had 25. He reckons that he could have 23 or 22 today because of the losses that he could have incurred last night. Last week Friday they had two lines going straight through the village and uh, hyenas as well, which is now also causing a concern and is a real threat to human life as well. Western based Paradigms have had a lot of negative influence for conservation in that they have tried to manage protected areas in a completely wrong way with this wilderness-based approach that really has had a lot of um, bad influence for uh, community attitudes on, in, in conservation. People have lost access to areas, lost reuse of natural resources in these areas and uh, lost um, ownership of areas that they used to have. And so uh, this has caused a lot of problems. He doesn't know why hunting stopped. There was never any consultation. They just woke up one morning and they were told that your source of income, your way of life, it has abruptly been stopped. Was it not worthwhile in terms of revenue? while the animal numbers going down, there was just never any consultation and um, they are still waiting for a, an explanation really why their livelihoods were changed. We had an almost collapse of some of the community-based organizations because hunting was the, the main uh, revenue and communities, some lost their jobs, some projects actually were stopped and the communities were now forced to revert some of the 
some of their concession areas to photographic tourism. But you look at some of the concession areas, these are marginal areas. The majority of them were marginal areas where photo tourism cannot survive. No photo tourist would love to go to an area where really it's just marginal and you will drive and drive and drive and see nothing. So right now, some of these areas are actually not being utilized and it's not an economic ideal really to have vast areas which are marginal, which are not used. Mohanti Narizarubona He's basically just telling you that when there was hunting, if, for example, an elephant got shot, that carcass would be cut up. Enough would go for the stuff that would be working in that camp. And that elephant would be cut up, it would be presented to the people, and people would spend the whole day there making strips. Each and every family got meat. Currently what's going on, they have to really struggle to find protein because if meat does come here, if somebody does slaughter an animal for sale, the, the, the meat is quite expensive to a point where they have to live off soup. Communities lost some protein with the hunting ban in 2014. We can quantify the amount of protein they lost. Uh, let me take elephants as an example. They used to be given 40 elephants to hunt in a particular year. And we know that uh, one elephant equals to about 35 cows multiply 40 by 35 and uh, we can now tell the amount of meat that they lost in tons. So they lost a lot of meat and uh, some of these communities you know they, 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 they live in areas where they cannot uh, uh, rear livestock like cows and the like. So if you have communities no longer having access to, to protein, therefore you are denying them some of the, the, the basic food necessities that they need. You've got areas that are suitable for photographic. The photographics are operating there successfully. You've got areas that are not suitable for photographics, that could be suitable for hunting. Why are the photographics allowed to operate in areas that are suitable for photographics and areas that are suitable for hunting? Why is there no hunting? Why is there discrimination between the two industries? Does government favor one over the other at the expense of the communities that live in these areas? I think there's like eight different compounds here. That probably relates to six families. None of these families here are employed in the photographic industry. Understandably, they can't employ everybody, but now these people here should still be able to earn a living and not now be sitting idle just like they're sitting idle now. Once the hunting ban was imposed, there, it became really clear to everyone that, 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 uh, that very few direct benefits were being, um, were being allocated to the rural communities that lived just outside the fences of the, these very wildlife rich areas. The photographic industry, according to him, interfered with the hunting side and eventually stopped it. They never hunted on the photographic concessions. Why did they find it so necessary to campaign or to advocate for the ban of hunting when they never interfered with the operation in any way and they promised them jobs and he's been sitting here now for five years. He was a tracker. He can't speak English. Even if they come here looking for people to employ, they are never considered the people that the old guys that used to work in the, in the hunting industry because they don't have the credentials to work in the photographic industry. Communities which were involved in hunting before the hunting ban, really, almost everybody was doing something. I did a study in 2010. In Sankoyo, Kwai, and Mawabe, there was almost zero unemployment. In, in Gamiland alone, I think 200 jobs were lost. Each country would rather want to see employment being created than being lost. If the hunting could come back and these animals had value for the community, revenue generation, employment creation, they would not, as a community, allow any stranger that they don't know, including even seeing strange tracks in a place where they, don't, they feel that that guy does not belong, or those people don't belong. They will be the first to report those people to make sure that the authorities take care of it and that there's no poaching in the area, simply because those animals will be a way of them making a living off of them through trophy hunting 
it will be a way of them feeding their families. They will protect these animals as the community, knowing that this is a resource that earns the money, that works for them. As it is now, there's really no incentive for them to do that because they're, they're getting nothing out of it. So there's good examples of where it has worked very well, where communities can maximize their income, such as the Chobi Enclave Community Trust, where they used to have the photographic tourism all along the Linyanti swamps. No hunting in that area that was just for photographic. And then in the back country, far away towards the Chobi Forest Reserve, they had the safari hunting, which was bringing in a lot of money to the community. And so these communities could, were really optimizing the income they were getting. Now, taking away the safari hunting, they only have the photographic. They're not getting anywhere near the amount of money that they could be getting from the system. The Westerners are trying to dictate their false paradigm of management of protected areas in Africa. They are armchair critics from afar, and they use ransom and threat. And for some of us in Africa, who have been through periods of colonization, it's a painful, horrible reminder of our terrible past, where we were abused by an onslaught of racist underdevelopment and neglect, a total abrogation of the basic elements of civilization. We've stopped along the road on the Saronga area just to check on some of these big baobabs. We've come across these ones here. There's a cluster of four, and this one is just the monster. They are unfortunately along a very busy elephant highway. Now, elephants naturally feed on baobabs, but the damage that they cause, the tree will heal up and you know continue growing. But unfortunately, due to the high population density of elephants in this area, these trees are now at a point where they're never really given a chance to recover. They are fed on every day, and that never gives the tree enough time to recover. Like you can see with this one here, this guy will soon succumb to the pressure. I'm no baobab expert, but this is two, maybe 3,000 years old. It could be just a matter of time before icons like this are down on the ground. And according to the local communities, it's not just this cluster of baobabs. It's all the big baobabs in the area that are suffering from such kind of damage. Another casualty to elephant overpopulation pressure in this area is the Mopani forests occurring along the fringes of the delta. Years of continual overutilization by elephant have reduced the woodlands to a wasteland of gnarled stumps. The vegetation that we have in our rangelands does not only support elephants, it supports other species as well. So you have the elephants destroying the vegetation. What it means is that you are also destroying uh, the food for other wildlife species. So in reality, uh, when we don't remove these elephants, we are going to have a situation one day whereby there will be a crash. Other species as well will, will die of starvation. Driving along this road between Betsa and Gudikwa, we came across this field and it's the only field on this road that seems to have a crop on it or a productive field. And we just thought that it'd be worthwhile to ask the farmers here how they are managing or how they have managed to produce so much when everybody else seems to have um, given up. Oh, thank you. I was just asking her how they have managed to actually produce a crop when everybody else seems to have failed. The whole family has basically moved onto the field. They make big fires at night when the elephants try and raid. They beat drums. They make as much noise as they can. But if the elephants insist on getting in and they're not really afraid of um, the noise that they are creating, then they have no choice but just to basically run. And if it's a significant number of elephants, they can even get off the field and just run into the, into the bush without knowing, well, they know where they're going, but they, they don't know of the dangers that, are, that could potentially be in, in, in front of them in terms of, as we've heard, there's you know, predators and other elephants in this area as well. If the crop doesn't get raided by elephants, they can produce about 38 bags of millet, which is enough to feed this family for the entire year. <laughs> Ah, 
Literally, those 38 bags are just enough to carry this family throughout the year. They don't even have enough surplus to sell, to get other things. That's their entire livelihood. That's what they completely depend on. If they don't get the 38 bags that they need for the year, they have to ask for food from neighbors. Those that give them, give them. And then the only other alternative source of trying to earn a living, a livelihood, basically, is to try and work with social network program known here as Ipeleking. So we are in this millet field where these ladies have to deal with not only elephant but quillia bird during the course of the day. It's a tiny little bird that eats cereals and grains and they usually move in huge flocks. And if one or two or three of those flocks lands in here, that could also decimate this crop. As you can see, they are beating the plastic bottles and whistling and moving about in the field to keep the birds away. So they don't only have to deal with elephants at night. During the day, they have to try and keep these birds off their crop as well. Not a very easy life. These are human beings you're talking about. They are citizens of my country, possessing equal human rights with everybody else. Not second to any. They are human beings. And if we do not pay attention to the existential challenges of coexistence with such species, then we probably stand readily accused of abrogating their human rights. We're standing on the Dongo Riverbed. This is a river that is a backflow of the main Okavango Channel, and it flows along all these communities of Sironga, Ikoha, Beza, all the way up to Gudikwa. The last time when it was this dry was around 96, 1997. But this year, because of the poor rainfall, the river has completely dried up. This is the river that the communities here were depending on for drinking water and fishing. But now what they have resorted to doing is they are digging little well points in the riverbed so that they can get their drinking water. Elephants also come and use these well points for drinking and sometimes end up destroying them. The old lady that we just met now, Marisheko, fetching water from the well there, Kalistas was telling me that she's got two sons who have now both relocated to Kasani to go and look for work because they have given up on the traditional way of life of farming with cattle and growing their crops. And this has left her with two grandchildren that she now has to fend for. We decided to come and spend the evening with this family that we met earlier today, that are the only ones that have a crop in the field and on this whole stretch of road. They've got these big bonfires burning along the perimeter fence of the entire field. Just before they go to bed, they'll come and stoke them up again and pray that it works in keeping the elephants out. If it doesn't work and the elephants do come through, the entire family will wake up, try and make as much noise as they can by beating drums, clapping their hands, whistling, while some of the other members will go back to the perimeter fences to stoke up these fires in the dark without knowing whether or not they'll run into elephant. It truly is a very difficult life of this family for them trying to protect their crop. I'm on the highway between Kasan and Francistown which is a major trade route between South Africa and the rest of Africa. Panda Matenga is the granary of Botswana. And I'm just going to go there and have a chat with some of the commercial grain farmers there to see how they're coping with the elephant problem. The Panda Matenga farming project began in 1984 when the government of Botswana allocated an initial 25,000 hectares of virgin bush to pioneering commercial farmers. The aim was to increase the country's cereal production and boost food security. With fertile black cotton soils and an annual rainfall of 600 millimeters, it was the most suitable area in the country for crop production. Transforming this expanse of wilderness into agricultural lands proved to be challenging. When it first started the scheme, there was no fence, and it soon became evident that it was not going to work due to all the animal pressure and damage. Thankfully, I think about 2002, the government put this fence around the farms. 
Before we had the fence in Panda, we had huge problems. We had a lot of elephants in the fields, we couldn't control them. We had two, three hundred herds of buffalo going through the fields, destroying a crop in one night. We had the eland coming through. And since they've put up the fence, production in Panamatenga actually went up about 120 percent. 92 percent of all cereal production in Botswana came from Panda. So it helped a lot with the food security in Botswana. We recently started looking at export markets and we're currently producing two beans, which we use as a crop rotation on our cereal to be exported, which opened a new opportunity for the farmers. We're exporting currently chickpeas and also mung beans, which helps a lot with all the nitrogens we get back in the soil for the next year's cereal production. The Pandamatenga area provides significant employment to the people of the country. The permanent employees in the farms during normal activities will range about 600 people. And then at peak season, an extra of about 1,400 people come and then we'll have an average of about 2,000 people working in the farms. This fence is uh, approximately 160 kilometers long, encircling the farming area. Cropping land, approximately 43,000 hectares. We are grateful for the fence because without the fence, they wouldn't be this farming. But it comes at a, as a, at a huge cost to us because we have to pay a, an annual levy, which is currently at 15 pula per hectare. We employ a contractor. We currently pay him 36,000 pula a month. And his job is to go around and ensure that the fence is up to speed, especially the voltage. Those wires on either side of that fence are producing electrical pulses between five and 7,000 volts. And that's the deterrent for elephant, eland, buffalo. Giraffe is a big problem. The male on the outside, he fights the giraffe, male on the inside, and they tr destroy the fence. And also males break in to get to the females. So we really need to get all the giraffe out. And with a game capture of trying to push him through the fence has failed. We've done it a number of times. The only solution to getting the giraffe out is to dart them one by one and move them out. We've had a major problem with elephant here. We had one elephant that had learned how to push a pole over and then short the wires out and then push the fence down and walk in. And our main fear was that that elephant was going to teach other elephants that method of getting in. He was busy for more than a year maybe, and it most probably cost us in the region of half a million pulla, the damage. We requested permission to shoot that elephant. We were denied. DWNP stepped in and came and helped us to translocate the elephant. When they put the fence up, there was quite a lot of wildlife trapped within the fence. These animals have continued to breed and they pose some threats to our farming production within the farm. Uh, my first year of farming in Pandamatenga, I had a huge loss where the elands damaged 100 hectares of my cowpeas. They came and fed into my cowpeas. And then one main problem being the bush, because I was still debushing the area. I had parts that I had already debushed and then there was still a huge bush where the eland would just come and hide in there. I even had to work at night, come with my workers to chase away the eland from the, from the crop, but we were just fighting a losing battle. They ended up having to destroy the whole 100 hectares. The only way we can manage this wildlife is either by uh, shooting them when they're in the fields or translocating them out of the farming area, which we have done. These animals, they eat our crops. We don't get any compensation and when we shoot them, uh, all the meat belongs to the government and go, it benefits the community, yes, and, and the meat is auctioned, but we don't get anything. And I think that needs to be looked at somehow. We have a lot of jackal on our fields. They are our friends because they eat the mice, which can build up in the farm, especially with all this grain lying on the floor after harvest. We protect the jackals, and also we have lions and uh, leopard which come in and, and eat the wildlife. The other challenges that we face as farmers here are issues of um, quilia, quilia beds, the, the doves as well. They come and destroy uh, our crops. In the previous 2017-2018 cropping season, we had a huge infestation of quilia in the, in the area. We'd have a situation where quilia can just destroy a whole 500 hectare farm within a month. Quilia is the third most significant damage to crops in Panamatenga. The government has tried many different things. Uh, one of the 
methods they use is uh, blasting at the roost sites, um, which is somewhat effective, but it can take weeks to find a roost. And in the meantime, they can, uh, about 5 million birds damage 50 tons of sorghum a day. Um, so these roosts that we find in Panda have been up to 20 million birds. Um, so it can do significant damage on a daily basis. These falcons don't catch quilia or doves or anything else. We just call them for a food reward once they've cleared the field. So it's a positive reinforcement, very environmentally friendly and with significant results. And this project has been going since uh, the research trials in 2013. When they stopped hunting some years ago, the hunters used to put water holes outside the fence and maintain them throughout the year. The elephants were thousands in the bush here. And then when that all dried up, we've definitely seen a reduction in the number of animals in these hunting areas because they've had to move to find water. It would be interesting to see the correlation between the stopping of hunting and elephants and predators moving into previous areas where they were not seen, causing a human wildlife conflict. I'm on the banks of the Chobe River. On the other side of the river is Namibia. And where we are now is the town of Kasani, which is the gateway to the Chobe National Park. The Chobe National Park, covering some 11,700 square kilometers, was established in 1968. Four geographical areas define the park. The Chobe Riverfront, the Ingwezumbe Pans, and the Savuti and Linyati systems. The park is one of the country's top tourist destinations, and the main draw card is its elephants, the highest concentration in Botswana. Unsurprisingly, photographic tourism is doing well, providing a range of employment opportunities across the different sectors. Boating trips along the Chorbi River offer visitors an excellent opportunity to view the varied wildlife and plethora of bird life at close quarters. Whilst tourists may perceive the reserve as the ultimate photographic safari destination, not everyone has the same point of view. I am the chairman of the Chobe Fresh and Dry Fish Association. Photographing and the fishing, there are two different things. We don't fish on the ground, in the bush. We get fish from the water, in the river. And the photographing, they are not photographing fish under the water. They are photographing animals in the bush, the concessioner who is holding that camp. They don't want us to go to the river. Now they want to control even where they were not allocated. We are sharing this river with the Namibian. The Namibian people, they are allowed to catch fish here. After getting fish here, they come to us and sell the fish to us that they are getting from the same river. And we are not allowed to catch fish here. These are our resources. We are sharing the river with the Namibian and we should all have the same access. Our government must look into this issue and find a way how he can help us. I'm on the banks of the Chobe River, along the boundary of the Chobe National Park and the town of Kasani. And the contrast in vegetation is absolutely amazing. It's so obvious. The riverine vegetation in the park has almost completely been decimated. And in the township where there is not that much elephant activity, the vegetation is still quite healthy. The border town of Kasani is in a state of transition from a laid-back tourist destination to a regional transportation hub. The ferry across the Chorbi River, which links Botswana to the rest of Africa, will be superseded by a multi-million dollar state-of-the-art bridge. Much needed development in the district will follow, but with this progress, human-wildlife conflict will inevitably intensify. The Chorbi River is the main water source for wildlife in the area, especially during the dry season. Attempts to accommodate the game animals' needs have been made through the establishment of corridors from the surrounding forest areas to the river. I'm in between Plateau. This is a residential area and the main town of Kasani. And there's a deep escarpment between the two here. So what the municipality did is that they put 
they put down a flight of stairs. The residents of our plateau that work and shopping, they go down to do it in Kasan and come back up here. As you can see now, some of these gentlemen are knocking off now. Unfortunately, last week, there was an incident of an elephant trampling one of the residents of plateau and trampling him to death. And what the municipality is now trying to do is clear a bit of bush along the pathway so that at least the people using the stairs can see the elephants and stay away from them. Um, but I've been talking to a few of the residents of Plateau here and their feeling is that this whole area must just be cleared. You can see right here, right next to the flight of stairs, there's evidence of elephant activity in this area. My journey across the length and breadth of Botswana to find out the extent of the human-elephant conflicts was an enlightening experience. Its scale and the real effects that are impacting the lives and livelihoods of the rural communities is almost incomprehensible. I spoke to different people, different farmers, livestock, crop farmers, people who were doing both, families that were depending on farming completely. But what you pick up is there is a certain sense of hopelessness. Some of the people that you talk to are not just worried about the loss of livelihood. As people abandon their homes, they abandon their fields, they abandon their cattle posts. You've got all these young men and women who are supposed to be tending to their fields, who are supposed to be tending to their cattle. They are now sitting bored, and what's next? All sorts of social ills are now coming up. It's actually destroying the social structure of some of these communities because of this huge elephant problem that quite evidently is there. Everybody agrees that this country has got too many elephants and they are having a negative effect on communities, on the vegetation, and we need to come together and discuss this issue of elephants and agree on a way forward because we need each other. There is space for everybody. There is space for the farmer, there is space for the photographic safaris, there is space for the hunters. We just need to come together and discuss these issues and map a way forward. In May of 2019, the presidents of Zimbabwe, Zambia and Namibia, along with Angola's environmental minister, joined Botswana's president, Masisi, at the inaugural Elephant Summit in Kasani. Technical workshops were held before the summit, where experts in various fields of conservation gathered to exchange ideas. The objectives were to examine the current status of the African elephant, human-elephant conflict, legal and illegal trade, as well as to reach consensus on solutions to address the challenges posed with the emphasis on rural community participation. The conference was held under the auspices of the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area, Kaza. Kaza lies in the Kavango and Zambezi River basins, where Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia and Zimbabwe converge. It covers some 520,000 square kilometers. Kaza is actually a multi-use landscape. We are talking about protected areas, buffer zones, such as game management areas in Zambia. You are talking about communal areas and conservancies, forest reserves and the likes. A considerable proportion of the wildlife resources in Kaza is actually found outside protected areas. One of the unique features that this area offers is it hosts approximately half of the African savanna elephants. And uh, the opportunities to uh, increase the range and increase the population in uh, some of the countries where the numbers have been depleted due to poaching over the years is immense. We've identified 13 elephant corridors along the eastern side of the Okavango and those ones are now incorporated into the land use planning and they won't be developed on um, in the future. Um, with arable fields, so that allows space for elephants to move. But then through that same land use planning, identifying the areas which are good for agricultural production and also where the settlements can develop so that it provides the space that's needed for people as well. It's time to get rid of emotions, emotions that are not based on scientific fact. It's time that we implemented a scientific best practice for conservation, which we already know the key details of scientific best practice, and we have to implement that. It is sustainable utilization of natural resources that we are after. And part of the recipe of ensuring sustainability is very entrenched community involvement. There is no sustainable tourism. There is no sustainable utilization of our wildlife species without people being at the center of it. The status that you confer on a local community when you devolve authority to it, that means more to them that they are the authority in their local area 
then any benefits that you give to them. I've never been disappointed yet. Every single community that's been empowered that I know and I've been involved with has blossomed. If you've got a very valuable resource, like Botswana has with its elephants, communities will go along with you because of the high value of the benefits. But if that value of benefits drops, they won't go along with you. So in all our policy frameworks and in all our laws, in all our economic empowerment programs, our people come first. And so we ask the world, and particularly the critics of what we're doing, to come visit us and realize that we are a people who think and feel, who want the best for our people. They are people who have hearts, veins that run through their bodies. They pray, they are God-fearing, they are religious, and they have challenges. But they have a right to development. And we have a right to determine that path of development. So we're going to do it. <laughs>